Hello, everyone. I'm Saad Omar. I'm the director of the Yale Institute for Global Health, also known as YGH. And welcome to the YGH Global Health Conversation Series. Uh, this is a venue to learn from and connect with innovative leaders in global health. Um, in addition to YGH, we're indebted to the George Herbert Walker Jr. Lecture at the Macmillan Center at Yale for co-sponsoring today's event. Uh, while we have seen progress, uh, uh, significant challenges remain in our global health response to COVID-19. The, the pandemic continues to take a devastating toll in communities around the world. Uh, and critically important issues, are especially around equity and the availability of vaccines remain. So if we were to beat back COVID-19, we need to respond as a global community. Uh, the World Health Organization, as most of you know, plays a central role, if not the central role, in marshalling the global response to the COVID-19 pandemic and, and many other critical health issues. Um, over the next hour, we will discuss a range of issues, uh, including the importance of ensuring equity in tackling the pandemic, uh, the value and role of, uh, of the WHO in the world, and um, since uh, we are uh, connecting uh, from the US uh, at our side, the importance of re-engaging the United States in the global response. It is truly an honor for me to introduce today's guests, uh, Dr. Tedros Adhanom uh, Ghebreyesus. Um, he was elected uh, the Director General of WHO in May 2017 and is the first person from the WHO African region to head the world's leading public health agency. Uh, he has been a pioneer in global health well before his start with WHO as the Director General. He was born in the Eritrean city of Asmara. Dr. Tredros graduated from the University of Asmara with the Bachelor of Biology before earning a Master of Science in Immunology of Infectious Diseases uh, from the University of London, a PhD uh, in Community Health from the University of Nottingham and an honorary fellowship from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Following his studies, uh, Dr. Tedros returned to Ethiopia uh, to support the delivery of health services and doing some pioneering work, um, starting as a field level malar malariologist before heading a regional health service and later serving in Ethiopia's federal government for over a decade as Minister of Health and Minister of Foreign Affairs. Under his leadership, Ethiopia expanded its health infrastructure, developed innovative health financing mechanisms, and expanded its health workforce. A, a particular, a major component of reforms he drove was the creation of a primary healthcare extension program that deployed uh, approximately 40,000 female health workers throughout the country. A, a significant result was an approximate 60% reduction in child and maternal mortality compared to the 2000 level. Um, so as Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs from 2012 to 2016, he elevated health as a profession, uh, uh, health as a political issue nationally, regionally, as well as globally. And in this role, he led efforts to negotiate the, the Sababa Action Agenda in which uh, 193 countries committed to the finance uh, financing necessary to achieve sustainable development goals. Prior to his election as the DG for WHO, Dr. Tedros held many leadership positions in global health, including the chair of the Global Health Fund for uh, a, a Fund to Fight AIDS, uh, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, chair of, of, of the Rollback Malaria Partnership, and co-chair of the Partnership for Maternal Newborn and Childhood Board. After taking office as uh, the WHO Director General, in 2017, uh, he initiated the most significant organizational transformation uh, in that organization's history, which has generated a wide range of achievements. Welcome, Dr. Tedros. We're so pleased to have you here with us today and would love to start with a few remarks from you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Saad. Can you hear me? Absolutely, Lord, loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Um, First of all, I would like to say, I just started earlier telling you, um, I have a very strong link with uh, Yale University. That started when I was Minister of Health in Ethiopia. And uh, the bridge was uh, your own uh, 
director of uh, global uh, health at the time. Now she is the president of Vassar College, uh, Dr. Elizabeth uh, Bradley, I call her Betsy. Uh, so uh, we had a partnership, Yale University, Clinton Foundation, and uh, Ethiopian Ministry of Health on hospital reform. Uh, but it didn't just stop there. Uh, we cooperated on hospital reform, and we had one of the biggest uh, reforms in Ethiopia together, the three of us, Ministry of Health of Ethiopia, Yale University, and um, uh, Clinton Foundation. And that was followed, actually, when I became foreign <coughs> minister, uh, we continued the partnership and we used to have trainings organized by Yale, you know, John Lewis Gaddis on grand strategy and training our uh, diplomats on grand strategy. Uh, of course, we use grand strategy also for, for our reform in, in um, Ethiopia with the support from uh, Betsy and um, uh, John Gaddis. So I will stop there, but I have many, many stories. Uh, I could have told you link to Yale, but I would like to thank uh, Betsy, who has been the center, a force of nature actually, who helped in um, reforming the health sector in, in uh, Ethiopia. Uh, but not only Betsy, I have uh, many friends and I would like to uh, say hello and greetings to, to all of you. And I hope this pandemic will be behind us and I will have a chance to come to visit you at, at, at Yale. And of course, my uh, uh, sister uh, Betsy in uh, Vassar, I don't know if she's listening to this. She, <laughs> once Yale, always Yale, so she might be. <laughs> uh, then um, uh, greetings also to the members and the students of the Yale Institute of, for Global Health and to all the people following this event online. And thank you for the opportunity to, to be with you today and to discuss the critical need for equitable access to health services worldwide and the essential steps we must take to achieve this. First, I would like to give a special thanks to our moderator, my friend, Saad Umar, uh, for his kind words, as well as the support he's providing WHO and the world as a member of the WHO Technical Advisory Group, we call TAG, on Behavioral Insights, which is actually a new addition and part of the transformation in, in, in WHO. This independent expert group is advising WHO on understanding the many factors that affect people's behaviors and practices, which is vital for helping countries design more equitable health policies and programs. Of course, the chair is Professor Kass, and they were working with Saad very closely, Professor Kass from um, Harvard. This is the type of work that's critical to WHO's efforts to advance health for all, which includes not only universal health coverage, but also the social, environmental and economic policies and factors that affect health. As COVID-19 has harshly illustrated equity matters, this pandemic has thrived amid the inequalities and inequities in our societies and exploited the gaps in our health systems. It has exacerbated the disparities between and within countries, but while the pandemic has affected all of us, the poorest and most marginalized have been hit hardest, both in terms of lives and livelihoods lost. The impact of the COVID-19 crisis pushed an estimated 120 million people into extreme poverty last year. Gender inequalities have significantly increased with more women than men leaving the labor force. And as we speak, rich countries are vaccinating their populations while the world is poor, watch and wait. As you may know, high and upper middle income countries, which account for 53% of the world's population, 
have administered 83% of the world's vaccines. Meanwhile, low and lower middle income countries, which make up 47% of the world's people, have received just 17% of the world's vaccines. The inequitable distribution of vaccines is a moral outrage. It's also economically and epidemiologically self-defeating. As COVID-19 has shown, the pandemic is more than a health crisis. It has had grave consequences for livelihoods, businesses, and economies. The pandemic has shown that when health is at risk, everything is at risk. But when health is protected and promoted, individuals, families, communities, economies, and nations can thrive. Health should not be seen as a cost, but as an investment in productive, resilient, and inclusive societies. But globally, as you're observing, we're going in the wrong direction. Around the world, more households are spending an increasing proportion of their income on health. And more people are being exposed to poverty as a result of out-of-pocket health spending. It's clear that making progress toward this universal health coverage cannot just be a matter of a matter for ministries of health, but takes an all of government approach with leadership from the highest political levels. At the United Nations General Assembly in 2019, just a few months before the pandemic started, UN member states endorsed the high level political declaration on universal health coverage. We must learn the lessons of this pandemic and build on the political momentum for equity to mobilize investments for healthier, more resilient, and more sustainable societies. In closing, I would like to offer a few things to consider as you move forward in your studies and your careers in global health. First, Remember that health is part of a larger ecosystem that encompasses environmental, social, economic, and political factors. That's why it's important for health professionals and policy makers to take a multi-sectoral approach. Don't be afraid to work across disciplines. Partnerships can make us stronger and achieve the desired result. Second, search for examples of what works in countries and communities around the world. Reverse engineer them and see what might inspire further research leading to tangible global change. And best practices can be found everywhere in high-income countries, low-income countries, middle-income countries. And the pandemic has shown us that. Even the countries, the high-income countries, were very uh, vulnerable. And third, let's rethink the narrative around health. Not as a cost, but as an investment in our common future. Strong health systems and global health security are two sides of the same coin. Now, let's get started with our discussion. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you again, uh, Professor Saad Umar, uh, and back to you. Thank you, and, and thanks for the kind words about Yale and, and your previous interaction and collaboration and work with, with this institution. Um, you know, you, since you mentioned uh, Betsy Bradley, uh, uh, it, she and I had a, um, a chat a few weeks ago or, uh, around an event, and she was very much planning to attend, and she's likely to be listening in and, and, and streaming this. Uh, so 
uh, rest assured, one of your old friends is um, is very much here, uh, is likely to be here. Like um, I haven't confirmed it, but but she was intending to attend. So I think you know. Thanks for laying out this vision for an equitable future in health, but focusing on the more short term. Um, how does how do we as a global community work towards uh, equitable access to vaccines, treatments, and other health services in this pandemic? No, thank you, thank you very much. I think what's key in um, especially ensuring equitable access is um, uh, political commitment. Um, and that political commitment should actually emanate from a belief that um, sharing or cooperation, sharing of vaccines, that's cooperation, is in the interest of every individual country. So any country you name should, should believe that the vaccine equity is good to end this pandemic and it's in the interest of all of us or in the interest of every nation. I can give you one example. For instance, you know, uh, new variants are appearing. I know many countries are moving, especially high income countries are moving with high uh, vaccination coverage. Um, some of them may achieve 70 or 80% by summer or end of the, this year. Uh, but if the rest of the world remains unvaccinated or low coverage, like what we see now, 0.3% in low income countries, then the new variants will continue to mutate. And then you may find variants that may actually uh, evade the vaccines that are already uh, being used. Then <laughs> those countries who believe that they have already high coverage will be affected because there is a new guy, a new virus mut mutated significantly, means a new one, it's almost like new, that will uh, again affect them. So uh, they're doing it for their own um, uh, interests. And I think that understanding will help in vaccine equity, nothing else, to be honest. And the second, maybe the, to see it the other way, this is a common enemy. And unless we fight it together, unless we fight it in unison, it will use, it will not be defeated. And if we're divided, it will use the divisions to attack us. So, if we're divided, we're more vulnerable. If we work in unison, then we will be able to defeat uh, this, this virus and end the pandemic as soon as, as soon as possible. So it's a must, actually. The only way to end this pandemic is through cooperation. Uh, so that's it. It's really realizing uh, this issue that will, I mean, realizing this that will help us. And then, of course, I understand there are um, some concerns. For instance, um, the private sector. I think we need to put people before profits. Um, and we, we have to make a choice uh, because making profits will be at the expense of losing many lives and at the, exp then at the expense of extending you know, the, um, uh, the uh, pandemic. Uh, so, um, I mean, it's, it's very clear for those who want to, 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 to act. And then, of course, if there is political commitment, then you move into increasing production capacity by waiving IP. For instance, if you believe that, you know, people come first before profit, then you waive IP and you take other measures like technology transfer and so on to increase production, have enough supplies to share. But to make that happen, you will need also money. So you need to mobilize resources. As we speak now, we need 19 billion dollars for, for ACT Accelerator. 
but we're not uh, getting it. Uh, of course, uh, US has contributed four billion US dollars, but still there is a, 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 a gap. Um, but as you know, many high income countries are already spending a lot of money for their stimulus package. Um, 19 billion compared to the stimulus package is a very small amount of money. So if there is real commitment, which I say the political commitment, then the financing should also should also come because the increased production capacity cannot come without financing. So if we do political uh, uh, commitment, and that means we'll be followed by taking every uh, action to increase production, and then to increase production, we will need financing if we do those. Uh, and if we identify this virus as a common enemy, and it's in the interest of all of us, I think the vaccine equity uh, can be can be done. Thank you. Come back to you. No, I think I think thanks for highlighting the value of global engagement with WHO. Switching to the U.S., uh, what does that partnership look like moving forward? And 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 what explicitly is needed from your perspective from the Biden administration to fulfill the promise of WHO and and the multilateral system? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I would like to start by thanking uh, the Biden administration. As you may remember, during the election campaign, he promised to reverse uh, the former um, uh, administration's decision the day of his inauguration. So he signed a letter, actually, on January 20th that reverses uh, the decision. Uh, so he kept his promise. And second, um, I had a call on 21st January, the day I received the letter from uh, His Excellency the President. I received a call from Vice President Kamala Harris. Uh, and, um, you know, on U.S. commitment to work with WHO and to um, help global health. And then, sir, uh, I had a call with um, the same day, actually, uh, we, there was a presentation to our board by Tony Fauci. And then, of course, I had a call after uh, the Secretary of Health was appointed with, um, um, with uh, Secretary Xavier Becerra. Uh, you can see the, the strong commitment, and I have to really appreciate that. And what I expect is, what the Biden administration is saying now. For the US to be in WHO is good for the US, good for the US and good for the US citizens and good for the rest of the world and good for WHO. So joining WHO, working with WHO is in the interest of the US. Biden administration believes this, and we believe that, by the way. And it's in the interest of the rest of the world. That mentality is important um, because it's, it's the mindset that leads you to effective partnership. So the mindset of this administration is U.S. benefits, the rest of the world benefits if the U.S. engages WHO. That's very important. And that's why they're doing what they're doing now and which we were expecting, joining COVAX, supporting COVAX with 4 billion US, US dollars, and also um, uh, you know, reactivating all the program support they have been providing us, the financial uh, support, and working with us very closely, not only to fight COVID, but to fight other diseases as well. Yeah, so, it, it's it's um, yeah, this is what uh, we have been expecting, and uh, we we see that uh, that's happening, and um, we will continue to work with the U.S. Uh, very very closely, um, and um, you know have better outcome in the fight against this uh, pandemic, but at the same time, in in other uh, programs too. Wonderful. Uh, so. Um, you know, more than two dozen countries and the European Council president have signed 
a statement calling for the creation of, an, uh, of a new international treaty uh, for pandemic preparedness and response. What should be the key elements of a treaty and, 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 and your overall perspective on the treaty and, and, and what should be the WHO's role? Yeah, thank you. As you know, um, before the pandemic, many people, uh, many institutions, including WHO were saying, the world is unprepared for a pandemic. Um, and what we see now is exactly that. And not only we were saying the world is unprepared, but we were proposing solutions or actions. Um, but I think action was late. And that's why the pandemic is now wrecking havoc. And we know we now know how unprepared we were, and we now know what the major problems were, um, more than ever before. Of course, we knew them, but even the hardest way uh, we, we know now. And the problems are poor national capacity in emergency preparedness and response, and at the same time, poor global capacity. When there is poor, poor or weak national capacity, it makes us vulnerable as a, as a globe. Uh, and our strength is as strong as the weakest link, or we are globally as weak as the weakest link, unless we address the weaknesses that, that, that we have. So this is very clear now. And the investment should stop from um, national building national capacity uh, and the pandemic treaty can help. The maybe if I go to specific other challenges problems that are common factor, we be it as national capacity or global capacity is, for instance, we have seen weaknesses in sharing data. Very serious problem. There are problems in sharing pathogens or biological material. And there is a problem in sharing technology like vaccines, we just, we have been discussing. And there is a problem in sharing resources like financing, financing preparedness and response. So we believe that the new, uh, I mean, the pandemic treaty, which we are now pushing for can address these gaps without sharing information you cannot fight an outbreak epidemic or pandemic that has to be addressed without sharing the pathogens and if there is a problem in sharing pathogens and you know all the problems associated with that and without sharing vaccines now you see the disparity and the virus is continuing to wreak havoc throughout the world so we believe the pandemic treaty can address this specific uh, weak weaknesses, among other things. Of course, the pandemic treaty is not all about these five things I raised. It's more than that, but these are some of the critical ones. So national capacity, global capacity, sharing information, sharing pathogens or biological material, sharing technology like vaccines, and sharing resources and strengths and the whole global preparedness and response. That's what the pandemic treaty can do. And there is an opportunity now because of the pandemic. And let's use this pandemic as an opportunity. Like saying, there is a, as the saying goes, use every crisis as an opportunity. If we're going to use this crisis as opportunity, then the solution, pandemic treaty, that addresses the major weaknesses we had is very important and something that we can pass to our children and grandchildren. So before the pandemic, right before the pandemic, and, and if I can sort of editorialize a little bit, just right, just in time for the pandemic, um, you launched an initiative to um, transform the Secretariat, transform WHO. So there's been a lot of uh, you know, public discussion as there is in these kinds of situations about uh, you know, how the pandemic will impact WHO's trans transformation. 
So what, what are your thoughts on it? And, and as one would think that, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it in terms of certain aspects, while other aspects might re require some change. Uh, what are your, what is your perspective on, on, on that kind of a discussion? Yeah, thank you. I mean, that's a very important question. Um, you know, I will take you back actually, when I was running for my campaign to, for this position for DG, one of the priorities, four priorities, one of them was uh, emergency preparedness and response. And then as soon as I was elected, the first major speech I had was on pandemic preparedness and response. And that was in Columbia University in September, 2017, September, 2017. And I was asked to choose, you know, um, you know, whatever uh, area I would like to speak about. And I, I said pandemic preparedness. And I, I told actually the audience a story and how that started in the US and then uh, in a military camp uh, in the West, and then um, how that traveled to the East in New York, um, uh, you know, even started community transmission and across the Atlantic to Europe. I didn't tell them what it was, but I was just telling the story and how many people were killed. And then I told them the same thing can happen now. This happened in 1918. But the same thing can happen now. Then, of course, we started the design of the transformation. And because it was my uh, election promise, so one of the pillars was, was emergency. And um, uh, we started uh, actually building things that are very important for emergency preparedness and, and, and response. Not only the talk in Colombia, the first major speech I had as a DG, as after I became DG, but uh, that was real. Our fear was real. And that's why uh, I made it part of the uh, transformation. And we established as a result of the transformation, new emergency preparedness division, just for preparedness. And then a new science division with the first ever chief scientist was established. And of course, data, we pulled all data functions together and um, uh, we articulated with clarity some of the changes we need to make in order to help with emergency preparedness, but of course, the rest of the programs. Uh, also, WHO Academy uh, to help us with training because you need to build uh, capacity. And that's very, very important. And of course, other things. I don't want to waste your time and of the time of our, our audience students by listing all, but most of the things we have done um, as part of our transformation were very relevant for emergency response. Actually, we used those to fight the pandemic. Although, these things were done just a few months before the pandemic, but they were very helpful in many ways. I wish we had more time. <laughs> it was like immediate. Uh, and now, um, from what I see, it's a matter of building on what we have started. And the other very important element in our transformation was to, to make WHO a learning organization to make change constant. Meaning we will take the recommendations from the different panels, from the IPPR, from the IHR review committee, from IOC, from other platforms. Even if you have crazy ideas from Yale University, which I'm really close to give us, this pandemic is unprecedented. It has affected everybody, everybody on earth, every life. So we need to listen and accommodate that and continue to change WHO. So we have started why transformation is important. Um, we have started that transformation journey, I mean, and we know why transformation is important, but we even know that 
change should be a constant and we should accommodate change and recalibrate and reposition WHO, of course, the whole uh, global capacity on on regular uh, basis. So there is no problem that we started. We started something that, that's helpful for uh, emergency preparedness and response. It's a matter of building on it, but we need to accommodate more. This is unprecedented, so we should, we should do even more. We should even change things more significantly than it is now. Uh, th that's wonderful, and, and and thanks for being open to ideas. Uh, so that's the, you know, um, uh, th that that's that's a that's a great way of looking at it. Sort of how, as a globe, we learn from this experience. And uh, and just as an aside, uh, Yale is well represented in in some of these things, uh, as you know, uh, uh, Professor Ernesto Zadello, former president of Mexico, is a Yale professor and mm -hmm. is a part of the IPPR. So, so there is, uh, you know, that input. So, switching to the um, uh, the, the audience questions, and we're getting some some very interesting questions. And and one question, I think you briefly touched upon that, but but you might want to expand on that because of the specificity of the question. And 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 this, um, you know, questionnaire acknowledges. A questioner uh, acknowledges that uh, or, or highlights the disjointed nature of the global response from various countries um, and um, and other entities, private or public. Um, is there one specific item that jumps to mind as the most critical step we as a global community could take to minimize such discontinuity in the future? Can you, can you rephrase the question? So, so, so <laughs> the, pro the premise of the question is that there has been some discontinuity in the response by you know, various countries and private and public entities. Is there a single step or a sort of a finite set of steps that come to your mind that would prevent that from happening in terms of a disjointed response uh, uh, from happening in future pandemics and large public health emergencies. Yeah, so when you say disjointed, are you talking about global or in, in, in at country level? I, I'm, I'm talking about global, between countries. So you mean no uniformity in response? Exactly. So no uniformity. Okay. So, uh, you know, Europe's uh, response not harmonized with exactly. the US response and the response and, and sort of various countries implementing strategies that has have global implications, even for example, on supply chains uh, for vaccines and, um, and treatment, um, non-pharmaceutical interventions and, and so on and so forth. Um, and so, so that fragmentation perhaps hasn't served us well. Is there anything, first of all, feel free to question the, the premise of, of, uh, of this question uh, but but if you do agree that there has been this fragmented response this time by various countries, how, are there mechanisms that come to your mind that could help mm. prevent that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I, I, I don't think it would be a surprise to the students, but I will tell you one thing. Those who were not listening are actually the high income countries <laughs> because they, they think that they have the best system on earth. So they don't listen to WHO. Uh, but WHO has experts that come from different countries. So no country can claim that it has better capacity than WHO because we are a collection of diverse experiences and uh, capacities um, that could be better than any single country. And advice from WHO is like a collective advice from a center that accommodates all the experience and practices of many countries. So I think um, that's one, um, meaning the high income countries should take WHO seriously. And when WHO advises, they should, they should listen. You may remember some high income countries when we say this virus is very dangerous, they were saying, Oh, it's flu, we can manage it. When we say this virus is public enemy number one, in February last year, maybe you remember, 
they were saying, no, 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 we can let it circulate and then there could be herd immunity by letting it circulate freely and then we will be okay. We never, we, we fought back saying, no, it's not a flu. It's a very dangerous virus. It, it's very transmittable. It's a killer. It has these two dangerous combinations. That's why we call it public enemy number one. And sadly, the high income countries were not taking it seriously because they believe that they have better capacity. That's very important, by the way. Um, and then, of course, even if you don't categorize by high, middle, and low income countries, the many countries, because of many other reasons, that they were not following the advices. So going forward, what do we do to address this problem? That's why we're saying pandemic treaty. There will be areas that will address, you know, um, um, the um, um, uh, important elements uh, that the countries should really observe, all, all, all countries, whether they are high, middle, or low, low income countries. And accommodating it in the pandemic treaty would be very, very important. But even in the absence of the pandemic treaty now, uniformity of action or response is very important. Because when there is uniformity and when all countries do the same thing at the same time, the virus will not get a space to maneuver. And very simple, and anybody can understand it. You deny the virus a space to maneuver when you act as one. That's why we have been calling for cooperation. That's why we have been asking for solidarity. We have been proposing actions, public health, and we have been saying, please do it all, uh, because we, we knew that the same action everywhere could actually stop or slow uh, the virus. So going forward, I think institutionalizing the solutions will be important and the pandemic treaty will be one that will institutionalize. And then uh, of course, uh, both uh, high income and low income or uh, all uh, categories, high, middle, upper middle, low income, you should listen to a multilateral organization like uh, WHO. Uh, we have been uh, consistent on this, as, as you know. Although the virus was new and there could be some things we didn't know, we started by saying we don't know this, but this is what we think you should do. And then we started to learn together and um, we, we know better now. And going forward, I think uh, that uniform action will be very, very important. Back uh, to you, you. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and, and so th there's another question from the audience um, about um, the, the fact that global health funding has been reactive rather than sustained uh, and sustainable. So, and, and you very nicely sort of talked about learning from crises uh, to, to move forward. So how do we ensure um, going forward that governments and donors are held accountable to long-term impactful funding for health equity. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, if we're going to address that problem, that problem is very visible, as you said, uh, we have to get out, uh, out of this, public, uh, out of this panic and neglect cycle. So we always move in a vicious uh, cycle, you know, panic, neglect, panic, neglect. Okay, we, there is a, an, a, an epidemic or outbreak, we panic, we react, we finance, and then as soon as that's taken care of, then we neglect and, and, and so on. So we have to uh, recognize health threats as a constant threat. And the same thing can happen anytime. So the world should be prepared anytime, at all times. Uh, treat it like, for instance, a security problem. Countries, you know, the budgets they have for um, their defense or security, it's big 
and it's sustainable. And I think they have seen how health actually impacts even more than a terrorist because they prepare that because maybe because they have a threat from their neighbors or beyond. They prepare because of uh, fear of terrorism. Uh, but the virus, I think, ha has shown that it has more impact than what we fear. <laughs> um, it has impacted our economy. It has impacted us politically, socially, you name it. And the whole world has been taken actually a hostage. I have never seen since the Second World War if there is anything that has really frozen the whole world. Even Second World War, some parts were okay. <laughs> Um, so it affected everything. And it has shown that health is central. So if we cannot finance it sustainably, then I think there is something wrong with us. <laughs> We're not listening. <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's enough to listen now, more than enough. We were affected the hard way. So we, we have, we, I think we have listened and that's what I, I, I believe. And there should be a significant investment. And for sustainability of funding, where I will start is if we realize that health is central and we don't want anything like this to happen, then the simple answer is we have to believe in universal health coverage. We should stop commercializing health. Health is not a commodity for sale. Health should be taken as a human rights issue, like a foundation. And one ask I have is each and every country to put it in its constitution as a fundamental human rights issue and commit to health for all and do whatever, even the poorest on earth, whatever to keep its people healthy, to strengthen its, its system. Uh, you know um, what UK did because I just want I, want, I don't want any country to have any excuses. The UK decided on NHS immediately after the Second World War, Lord Beveridge, when its economy was in tatters, it decided to have health for all. That's NHS. So no country can have any excuse. So if we want this not to happen again, I don't see it as financing only, and meaning finance it, then I think that level of commitment will be very important. Health is central, health for all, we should move towards health for all and take it, even recognize it in our constitution. Many countries have done that and all countries should do that and they shouldn't commercialize health. When I say this, by the way, I have to be clear. I'm not saying private sector should not be involved and everything should be public. What I'm saying is government should take responsibility and the services can be provided through government, public or private sector, or, or, or what do you call it, uh, hybrid, or, or one of them, it doesn't matter, it's up to the country to choose. Uh, but I think the government spending, I mean, contribution is very, very important and government should take responsibility to make, to make this uh, happen. Uh, so that's how we can address the sustainable, sustainability of financing. Then globally, if we do this locally at national level, then sustaining global efforts will not be a problem. And for that, the recommendations we have is global financing. Let's not try to have new institutions for global financing, even for local, by the way. Uh, we can use IMF, we can use the World Bank, we can use the regional banks. Of course, they should develop some um, um, some flexible processes 
um, very agile processes, uh, but uh, and then commitment to pandemic preparedness and response, but the existing institutions can do it. Thank you. Sorry, I took uh, long on this one because it's very important. No, I agree, and it's nuanced. So as we reach uh, sort of the, the the last part of our conversation, so I want to highlight a qu another question from, from the audience. Um, uh, as you know that in pandemics and large public health emergencies, the evidence base is changing. So the question is, is there a way, is there a creative way for global universities to be more directly helpful to the WHO uh, when its needs are acute for all evidence-based reviews and rapid responses? You know, uh, the, the collaborating center model is very much there, but as you know that it takes time and often new players are needed and agility is needed in public health emergencies. Uh, so is there, a, you know, for example, the questionnaire suggests, uh, you know, is there a value of a master contract uh, that uh, where uh, that doesn't involve a lot of money or, or perhaps even no money, but there is a framework for rapid synthesis of evidence. So the intellectual capacity that is out there can be fully marshaled. Um, so, so we'd love to hear your thoughts on that, uh, especially as, you know, one of the uh, agenda you have uh, within WHO is the WHO Academy. So, so this capacity building, this e focus on evidence um, is I think in line with this kind of a question and a, uh, and a potential proposal. Thank you. I think you read my mind. I was going to say, oh, we have collaborating centers, but you <laughs> preempted by saying, I know about collaborating centers. So <laughs> this is by the way, um, we, we, we believe in networks. We have several networks there, some of them university-based, some of them other institutional-based. Uh, but from the way you say it, the master contract, it doesn't mean it involves money of universities. I think network of those would be very important. Um, why not you develop this as a concept? Uh, what I like about Yale is the grand strategy. That's where you process and bring new ideas. So I, I see this as a new idea, just purely universities, and we don't go into that uh, process of collaborating centers, but a different way of partnership with universities, both in the South and North, everywhere, all over the world, low income, high income, middle income. And if you can develop a concept with your students, and we would be happy to have a follow-up discussion on this, but I, I think this may evolve as a, a good, a good uh, way of uh, partnership with WHO. Thank you so much for that. Uh, wonderful. So, so the last question. And then we have the WHO Academy, but yeah. the partnership with universities may not be just for training. It could be other other things that's why it's, it, it could be more than training of course the who academy starts with training but for the future it will have a, a, a research arm so it, it could that could be the center by the way to coordinate all the opportunities that we can have uh, globally by the way the who academy is also new it's an outcome of the transformation uh, yeah. and um, it, it, it can also take part in here. But that's a very good idea. would be happy if you can develop it further and have a follow-up meeting. So one last question uh, before we wrap up uh, is that as we move beyond the pandemic and, and you have vociferously advocated from the beginning, even before you took charge of WHO about the universal healthcare agenda, um, how do we, so the pandemic will subside one way or another. We will have to be ready for the next one. How do we re-engage or even uh, engage with more vigor uh, in the uh, universal healthcare agenda um, in the next few years? Yeah, um, I think this is very, very important. Um, we, we, we're already, saying to the international community uh, what I just said earlier. And now, because of this pandemic, we know how central health is. And that investing in universal health coverage is, is uh, the, the, the answer. 
And the pandemic itself has already, uh, what do you call it, um, strengthened the case for Health for All or, or, or UHC. Uh, so we have already start, started engaging, but we will continue to even do it more. But the messages are exactly what I told you earlier, what I said earlier. Meaning if you ask me one, one thing, very concrete thing that countries can do, if they can put it, their commitment could be put in their constitution, UHC or um, um, health for all. So we have a specific ask now to, to, to make and to ask countries when we engage, when we continue to engage, uh, that they should put it in their constitution because that's, the, that's actually uh, the, 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 how you would know um, how committed a country is when, when they put it in their, in their constitution. So it's, it, it, make, it, it made it easier for us now uh, to explain why health is central. Uh, it's very tragic, all that happened, more than 3.2 million people have died already uh, because of this pandemic, but it has shown us beyond any doubt the centrality of, of health. So there is already good opportunity to push uh, the agenda and look forward to working with you to push the health for all or the universal health coverage agenda. Thank you very much. And um, as we wrap up this conversation, I wanna uh, thank you, Dr. Tedros, for being a passionate ac uh, advocate for universal healthcare and uh, very specifically health equity uh, for well before this pandemic. And, and I know uh, based on that track record that you will continue to be a, an advocate for uh, global health equity. And, and thank you for working with the fierce urgency of now, to paraphrase, to borrow a, a, a phrase from Martin Luther King um, Jr. that, uh, you know, which was required in this pandemic. And I think WHO's uh, response, the global response um, has shown us the indispensable nature of institutions like WHO and that these institutions matter. It matter for, uh, from, um, uh, you know, uh, from Kansas to Kathmandu, uh, because we all use the one or another function that WHO fulfills, the, the convening function or, uh, we, we, uh, or, or the technical guidance function benefits us all. And it is in our interest to make sure that these institutions and specifically WHO is healthy and is, uh, it continues to move forward. So thank you very much for taking the time. Um, really appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Saad. And I would appreciate it if you can also pass my greetings to John Gaddis. Eh? I will, absolutely. I hope you will find ways to fight. fight. I will, you, you can catch him, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.